Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Friday, and also, more importantly, happy homecoming week. Um, my name is Emma Maynard, and I'm the Assistant Director of Career and Network Programming here in the Office of Alumni Relations. I'm also a proud double Duke, having graduated in 2007, uh, as well as getting my master's recently uh, this past May. Today's webinar is brought to you by the JMU Alumni Association. We're excited to bring you this alumni webinar program with the goal of providing career-related resources that help you conveniently cultivate your professional self. We have a wonderful representation of our alumni joining us today, and I want to say thank you so much for participating with us. Before I introduce today's speaker, just some brief housekeeping notes. If you're participating live, your microphones are muted for this presentation, but there are two chat options. Uh, there's a chat feature as well as a Q&A feature. For your major questions, we are asking that you direct those questions using the Q&A option and send them directly to me, the host, and I'll be sure to share those with April, our presenter. You can also use our chat feature uh, and select all participants to have an interactive, engaged conversation throughout the presentation with your fellow registrants as well as myself and April. We'd love for you to live tweet during this webinar. You can use hashtag JMUAA webinar. And as a reminder, this webinar is going to be recorded and accessed on our website within about a week under the career and networking section followed by webinars. However, as a token of appreciation for our Dukes engaging with us live today, you'll be entered into a drawing to receive a special prize courtesy of the JMU Alumni Association. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, April Armstrong, an alumna from 1992. She is the CEO of AHA Insight, which provides coaching, training, and expert facilitation to support executives leading strategic change of national significance. She is the author of The Day One Executive, a new book that prepares tomorrow's leaders to stand out on day one as an executive based on lessons gleaned firsthand from more than 20 years working with our nation's top leaders at the Department of Defense, the White House, and Fortune 500 companies. She also serves on the Entrepreneurship Advisory Board, as well as an Entrepreneurs in Residence program through our JMU College of Business. It's now my pleasure to turn things over to April. Take it away. Thank you so much, Emma, and hello, everybody. Welcome, and thank you all for taking time out of your day. This, and if you're on the East Coast, this is a particularly sparkly and glorious day for this webinar. I am truly honored and overjoyed, really, to be a part of this series. I think it's so fantastic that Jamie is now offering uh, these webinars through the Alumni Association so that all of us as Dukes can continue to learn from each other. When we're at JMU, we're learning from, you know, just the amazing, you know, student-oriented faculty that JMU is known for. And, uh, you know, when you graduate, even myself, I got a master's degree, as Emma did, many of you may have as well. Um, but once you're out of school, um, you know, you, it, it's easy to sort of lose touch uh, with, with that rich learning soil that JMU was and is. And um, increasingly, now that we're all out in the world doing all the various things we're doing, I just think it's so much fun and so stimulating um, to hear from all of you. I myself uh, am, have signed up for these, this webinar series and, um, you know, just really look forward to uh, what the future holds for all of us as we sort of support and coach and mentor each other uh, with all of the rich array of experiences that we've all been gaining since leaving that beautiful school. So thank you so much, Emma. Today, I am just uh, thrilled to be able to talk with you all, uh, you know, the day before we, we take on a homecoming football game against Rhode Island um, on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and certainly central to what has been my professional career. And that is really, uh, it's transformational change. That's what we're going to be talking about today, is how to really cultivate yourself as a leader of transformational change and how you can become a leader of leaders in that space. And the metaphor that I really love to use on this topic is a football metaphor. So that's why I'm just particularly thrilled that 
that this talk is um, corresponding with uh, with one of JMU's um, homecoming games. And as some of you may know, JMU is actually in its 45th football season. And, um, you know, just uh, the team, you know, with our new coach, just, you know, getting stronger and stronger every day. It's been really fun to follow them on, you know, on, on Facebook and Twitter. And, and when I can uh, attend live, attending those games live. The title of today's presentation is what I call Red Zone to End Zone. What change leaders can learn from JMU football? And um, I want to invite everybody as we, as we go forward, as, as Emma said, if you have a question, um, if you would submit it through the, the Q&A feature, that will go directly to Emma, and she'll be sure that, that I see that before the webinar ends, and we'll make sure that all those questions get answered. If you uh, just have a comment or some insight that you'd like to contribute as we move forward, because I'm certainly not the only one uh, you know, qualified to speak on this topic. Many of you may have had uh, experiences in this area as well, and I invite all of you to, to chime in with those um, through the chat feature, the basic chat feature, and again, if you would direct that to all attendees so that um, everybody can, can see those great insights. Now, some of you may be wondering, uh, you know, what, what, is, what is a red zone? Uh, if you're not a football fan, uh, fear not. We're gonna, I'm, I'm going to cover that before we go too far so that you can really hang with this metaphor as we move forward. But, um, but first of all, let me just clarify, who is this for? Uh, this is one of the questions that M asks of presenters, who are you really targeting the presentation? And in this particular case, this topic, I feel it strongly is relevant to really almost anyone in the professional world, and anyone from top corporate or government executives, senior leaders, rising stars, and even aspiring executives, even if you're still in school, if you're a student at JMU, it's not too early for you to be thinking about this and to be positioning yourself to stand out as that successful transformational change leader. In particular, though, I would say the one common thread across all of these audience types is that they are leading or they're interested potentially to one day lead complex multi-party change. So this is really not about one-on-one -on -one influence um, or one-on-one -on -one negotiation. That, that would be a whole separate talk. This is really about um, transformational change that um, I believe really changes the world when you need multiple parties to come into agreement around some key premises and to hold that agreement and then to really follow through all the way to the end zone. Now, why should you care? My answer to that, and when I speak with students, you know, I, I tell them it's because everything, ultimately, everything is ultimately about change. I'm often asked by everyone from students to even senior government executives who are you know, still looking for that next step in their own career. How can I stand out? And I tell them the number one way you can stand out is that you demonstrate that you have the ability to basically lead change. It's, it's leadership, but it's a very specific vein of leadership. It's really, truly um, not just getting uh, people to follow you, but um, it's really about igniting um, a whole cluster of leaders that are going out there um, and, and all of them leading an exponential sort of movement in a, in a different direction. That to me is really what this is all about. And whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, a professor, president of the United States, working at the UN, leading a Fortune 500 company, leading a startup where you're needing venture capital partners, a, you know, a market, Success in all of these domains is ultimately all about results, and results ultimately depend on people changing something, getting a lot of different people to do something different. So I strongly believe that your success as a leader is directly correlated with your ability to lead change. And I'm not alone. Harvard Business Review cites leading change as the single most sought after skill looked for in executives. Kevin Connolly, the new CEO of the famed executive recruiting firm Spencer Stewart, recently told the Wall Street Journal that one of the most critical requirements that boards screen for in a potential CEO is the ability to help employees not only embrace the need for constant change, but to be able to lead that change. And I had the very good fortune to meet 
Lieutenant General Russell Honore, the, uh, one of my personal heroes who led the successful response in the wake of the catastrophe that Hurricane Katrina was in New Orleans. And this man who not only led massive change in the form of a recovery movement in that devastated region, when many, many other agencies at the regional, state, local, and federal levels had been unable to step into that. He, I don't want to say single-handedly, but I, I do believe his leadership was instrumental in turning things around there. But, but he has a whole new focus now, looking at population growth over the next 25 to 30 years. By 2040, our population will grow from 6 billion to 9 billion people. That's just mind-boggling to me. But his whole mantra right now is the ability to lead change, transformational change, is becoming the single greatest differentiator. It's really becoming a new currency. So you may be able to tell I'm passionate about this and, um, you know, really, really wanting to, to join uh, forces with folks out there in the world, really helping to teach this particular skill set. It is a skill set. It's an art and a science. It's not, uh, it's not guesswork. It's definitely not sort of rolling a dice. Um, there's really a lot of uh, variables that need to be carefully monitored throughout that process, and I'm going to be showing those to you today. So the good news is that leading change is not rocket science. On the other hand, if any of you have ever been involved in a truly um, broad national scale or maybe even international scale uh, change initiative, then, then you find yourself sometimes wishing that it were. The number one reason being that the common denominator in, in large-scale change that, that can make it very, very tricky is the notoriously unpredictable variable called people. So while there are myriad variables in launching a spaceship to, to the moon, they are they're more predictable. The interaction of those variables is, is, is where a lot of the challenges can come in. But people themselves intrinsically, individually, are can be unpredictable, much less the dynamic interaction of those people. And that's really what creates the big challenges with leading change. So today, by the time we close at 1 o'clock today Eastern, these are really the three things that I hope each of you will be walking away with. Number one, how to not take any chances with the success of a high-stakes initiative. And let me tell you, I'll share a little from my own career as we move forward, but you never know when you could find yourself in charge of a high-stakes initiative. I want everyone on this webinar to be ready for that. Number two, three mistakes to avoid if you want to succeed with high-stakes change. And finally, what I call the playbook, sticking with that football metaphor, a formula for success. Now, before we go any further, let me first just check in because some of you may be wondering what qualifies me to speak on this topic. I was a French and communications major at JMU, and as Emma said, I graduated in 1992. And little could I have known at that time that I would actually find myself having intensive involvement with three of our nation's most significant transformational changes in the last two decades. I happened to work for a company that was involved specifically in projects of national significance. Uh, it, at the time, was the nation's largest research and development company. It later became a Fortune 500 company. This was before I went out on my own and formed my own company to be able to really specialize in this people side of change. But in the course of my career, I had the phenomenal opportunity to touch Number one, on the left side of this image, you see, you see a fire truck in the, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Of I received a phone call about a month after 9-11 inviting me to evaluate the nation's largest catastrophic response exercise called, called Exercise Top Officials. This exercise is sponsored by the White House, the, Department of, the new formed at that time Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of State. And in that program, it's a biannual event, and they basically simulate uh, multiple, up to three catastrophic disasters happening simultaneously, usually two in the United States and one on international soil. And everyone from the president down to firefighters, hospital staff, police, law enforcement, governors, mayors, um, hospital personnel, 
nonprofits like the American Red, Pro Red Cross, uh, private sector entities like Wal uh, Walmart, and all of the executive branch agencies, state and local agencies, emergency response organizations, all participate in this exercise, which is a live simulation for five days, 24 hours a day. They even have a mock media called Virtual News Network, VNN, with real news anchors uh, actually interviewing these officials on camera as the scenario sort of unfolds. The scenario, a uh, portion of it is scripted, a lot of it is unscripted, what they call branches and sequels, so that basically as decision makers make certain decisions, certain things are triggered, just as they would happen and sort of propagate out in the real world. It's a phenomenal, I think, I personally, my point of view on it is one of the best investments we're making in the federal government, um, preparing people at all levels for this type of infrequent, fortunately, but, um, but high stakes when, when these sorts of situations happen, high stakes events uh, where, you know, thousands of lives um, are, are at stake, certainly, and um, obviously tons of property and um, national security, truly, uh, is at stake. Within about a month of me being invited in to be a part of that evaluation team, I was put in charge of that evaluation team. I was not terribly senior at this stage of my career. I, was, I would definitely consider myself at that time sort of mid-level. And it was one of the most phenomenal leadership development uh, experiences of my life was the opportunity to, to lead that evaluation. Uh, and I won't go into all of the leadership uh, learnings from that. that. That, again, could be its own separate talk. Um, but, but probably the biggest thing, that was my first intensive observation of uh, complex multi-party change because our country was basically putting together for the first time the National Disaster Response System using a lot of um, lessons learned from uh, wildfire uh, response out in the West. That was really our, our country's primary exposure to anything like this um, prior to 9-11. And um, it was really in the aftermath of 9-11 that, that the country really began to come together and, and look at what, what should a national disaster, catastrophic disaster response and prepar, uh, preparation and response system look like and begin to codify that, codify that policy, codify that in training, uh, and, and really begin to change the way all of these entities operate under crisis, basically, and not just operating independently, but operating together as a system. And as we certainly saw with Katrina, you know, this is not something that you can do once or twice and have it work perfectly. Uh, tons of um, issues, as, as many of you know, if you followed Katrina at the time, uh, which again is a huge part of my gratitude for someone like Lieutenant General Honoré in the Department of Defense. But, um, and this continues to evolve, but, um, but that, was, that was a massive, uh, transformational change effort, and it continues today, certainly. The central center picture that you see there is really a shift. This started 20 years ago in the Department of Defense. This continues today um, in our federal government, and that's really the shift into what we would now call cloud-based computing, big data, and agencies beginning to share data and applications in ways that they never um, have before, never been able to before from a technical standpoint, and from a cultural standpoint, and this is really where we still are in many cases, um, have never been um, culturally motivated or incentivized to do in the past. But so much more becomes possible as um, wh whatever domain you're in, whether it's healthcare or space or national security, which is one of the areas I'm involved in personally, um, as, as, as agencies have been able to share data in new ways. But that's a massive transformational shift behaviorally, technologically, um, operationally, and, and, and politically in many ways. I've been involved in two major initiatives in that area with the federal government, both of which is involving a minimum of 18 agencies that are needing to come into agreement around uh, data standards, uh, architectures, you know, financing mod uh, models, uh, business models, um, policies, and um, and ultimately new ways of operating. It's a massive shift. It typically takes a, a decade, really, to make that kind of change happen. And uh, so that was sort of the second big change area that I've spent a significant amount of my career involved in. And the third one on the right that you see there, any of you that have any car made in the past five years probably have this technology, some of it beginning to appear in the car, especially in the luxury lines. And that is what 
they call connected vehicles. Um, and you may have heard of automated via autonomous vehicles, uh, the self-driving cars, things like this. That That's further off in the future, but it's all related. But the connected vehicles technology is basically cars becoming computers and roadways becoming computers. And in the very, very near future, I would, I would predict easily within the next decade, um, we won't be necessarily physically stopping at a stop sign or a stoplight. Cars are going to sense the stop sign, sense the stoplight, um, and, and begin to automatically slow or certainly automatically brake if you're not braking. Um, and there's a lot of complexity in, um, in, in those technologies, obviously a lot of civil liberties and privacy things getting worked out, a lot of security things to be worked out. Um, but this technology is coming, and the company I, I was involved with uh, was involved in the human factors testing of that with Cadillac and General Motors 20 years ago. My personal role in that has been uh, really helping to look at what it will take to change the way transportation engineering and transportation operations um, is is done in our country, um, and that involves a massive array of stakeholders, from legislators to automotive makers to roadway designers, uh, emergency services, I mean, you name it. But that's sort of the third big transformational change space um, that, that I've been involved with. And my involvement in all three of these spaces has been not only about studying what will it take uh, to make that change, uh, but leading a lot of the uh, strategic uh, communication and what they call um, often in government spaces, knowledge and technology transfer efforts to really bring people into, uh, into these new ways of doing things, um, as well as a lot of the consensus building underpinnings um, of these changes. Again, if anybody has any questions as we move forward, please, uh, please feel free to, again, enter that question into the chat or you know, throw any of your own insights into the comments uh, box as, as we go forward. So that's just a little bit of, of my background, probably the three most um, seminal experiences in my career that have made me um, not only very passionate about this topic, uh, but have helped me to see why it's so, um, I think, actually urgent, urgent as well as important that we really that we really catalyze uh, more and more people deeper and deeper inside of our own organizations who are able to be these change leaders so that we don't just have one person at the top dragging everybody into these kinds of changes, but we're really sort of anointing in a way uh, and empowering legions, legions of change leaders out there um, to help really accelerate these kinds of changes in our world. So, Question number two, though, before we go any further, just to make sure that everyone stays with us with this football metaphor, is really what's the red zone? So again, if you're not a football person, you might be wondering, what is the red zone? So what you see here is the JMU football field. And if you're going to homecoming, you'll see this very soon, starting tomorrow. And the red zone is basically, if I can get my mouse to work here, the red zone is basically that last um, 20 yards into either the opponent's, uh, you know, end zone or, or certainly our own end zone, right? So we're either defending uh, our red zone or we're trying to penetrate the opponent's red zone. So, um, you know, the thing about the red zone is red zones are tricky. There's, there's not much room to maneuver. Whereas, you know, all the other plays on the field, you sort of have the full expanse of the field to play with. When you're inside of a red zone, um, you're sort of boxed in there. And the stakes are high. They're high because from a football perspective, you've already invested a number of your downs. You've invested, you know, certainly the, you know, the energy of the players in moving the ball that far down into the field, into that red zone. So when things fall apart, um, in the red zone, you know, the hard work and the small victories that came before uh, are instantly erased. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, huh? you know, on, on that football field. Um, as it is in business and as it is with any kind of large-scale change. So you can make a lot of progress, but you're not done until that, that ball lands in the end zone. So as in football, you know, the finish line with a major initiative can look closer than ever as you are entering that red zone, that tantalizing moment when that end zone is, is within reach. You know, but beware, I like to say, because if your project requires anything or anyone to change in any kind of a significant way, you are at risk in the red zone when opponents you may not have even known you had 
may begin to tighten around you, may begin to appear on that field. Now, it just so happens that JMU um, has, is, is actually quite strong in the red zone. Um, I don't, you know, these numbers might be sort of confusing for folks, but I'll just quickly point your attention to the fact that JMU has been inside of an opponent's red zone 40 times uh, so far this season in 2016. And we have scored 34 out of the 40 times. That's phenomenal. I, I, I don't know how that compares specifically in CAA, but I will say uh, that, that's, a, that's a phenomenal stat by any standard. And that JMU football, many of you may know, was called CAA's most potent offense on September 23, 2016. Well, those numbers certainly speak to that. But the good news is that even teams that are not naturally strong in the red zone, like Alabama, that's where my parents both went to school, you know, they can also prepare to rock the red zone when they really focus on specific research-proven steps. And you can, too, as a conscious change leader, if you focus on the specific research-proven steps before you even step onto the, onto the field. And if you're wondering why is JNU so strong in the red zone, well, it may not surprise you to see that it's one of the main focal points for the Dukes, our new coach has said. Rocking that red zone is one of the main focal points for the Dukes. They are not leaving that to chance. And if you really want to succeed as the change leader, it will be for you too. So let's get ready to rock the red zone. So when it comes to change, let me just throw out a couple of statistics. And I like to call this the elephant in the room because a lot of folks actually know these, um, have a sense of this. I mean, they may not know these specific stats, but they have a sense of this. 98% of companies have had projects stopped in the red zone, meaning in the last sort of 20% of that initiative uh, budget or timeline or, you know, space to completion, basically. They never make it into the end zone. I was actually shocked at that number because I am aware that um, it's, it's somewhere between 55 and 70 percent of change initiatives uh, fail, uh, according to a lot of common statistics like Towers Watson and some other authorities, at corporate executive board, um, and it's the IT projects that tend to, to have that higher number, that higher failure number, closer to the 65 percent to 70 percent. But I, I was shocked to see that 98 percent of companies have actually had the experience of having a major initiative. Um, fall apart, fall apart in the end zone after a massive investment prior to that. The average cost overrun of an IT project is 200, I'm sorry, it's, it's 27%. And one in six of those project overruns, overrun costs by 200% and the schedule by 70%. Now I tell you this because if you're a young leader, if you're one of our emerging leaders or rising stars, um, this is something to be paying attention to because if you really want to stand out, you want to make sure you're part of the 30% that doesn't overrun the schedule. And the question that sort of has always interested me is, especially over the past 20 years, has been, you know, despite significant innovation over the past 20 years and things like project management with like the PMP, if, if you guys are familiar with the, the Project Management Institute's PMP certification. And process improvement, things like Lean Six Sigma, statistics and project success and failure overall have remained unchanged. I find that very interesting, and the question is why? Well, the answer is that because while efficient processes and sound project management principles are clearly very, very important, I think we would all agree, they don't go far enough to address the single variable most correlated with success, and that is namely the attitudes, behaviors, and motivations of the people on whom your success depends, both inside and outside of your organization. So what we want to do is really change this so that failure is the exception, not the rule in your organization, and certainly with, you know, all our leadership, especially here as JMU Dukes, right? So change projects fall apart in the red zone, really for one of three reasons. This is, you know, in my observation over the past 20 years being involved with these and, and, and studying this closely. And I call these basically three red zone risks. Red zone risk number one 
mistaking compliance for commitment. Too often, leaders of change are looking for compliance from their people, which to me is a very minimal standard. They're looking for compliance with new policies, procedures, technologies, or strategies as the evidence of success in rolling out big change. But even a casual glance at, at the performance differences between high engagement and low engagement in both public sector or private sector organizations really highlight why mere compliance is not enough. People will do the minimum to comply, and even that often only with a lot of costly prodding. But you really need to set that bar higher regarding the desired end state if you really want to see a sustained change. You really want those people making the choice to actively row with you in the new direction and new way of doing things, and, and ideally even leading others to do the same. So the key there is we got to go not for compliance, but we got to go for commitment. You got to first get consensus underpinning that change, and then don't stop there, go all the way to commitment. And we'll talk more about that later in the, when we look at the playbook. Red zone risk number two, assuming alignment and agreement throughout the life cycle of the project. So too often, you'll see leaders who might even make that initial investment in consensus on the front end of a big change. They're, they're, go, they're doing the right thing there. And then, they, and then they assume that that's like a fixed and static thing, and they sort of move on, and they're not, they're failing basically to continually re-enroll people in that initial consensus-based underpinning. The analogy that I use here is, um, is swimming. I don't know whether we have any swimmers on the line or triathletes on the line, but when you're training as a swimmer, you know, and you're swimming in a swimming pool, uh, you know, the environment is static, basically, right? You, you, can, you can afford to just focus on you and your stroke. But when you take that out to open water, an ocean or a river, it's not a static environment anymore. It's a highly dynamic and changing environment. And if you're only focused on you and your stroke, you're going to find yourself going to China, basically. So likewise, in a, in a large-scale transformational change initiative, you need to be out there continually monitoring the very dynamic environment that you're working in, the very dynamic environment that you're looking to influence, and continually reaffirming uh, that commitment, people inside of the commitment that they've originally made. And, and, and the commitment itself is going to shift and change. And you're, you're basically staying with that all the way to the end zone. And finally, red zone risk number three. And by the way, yes, Duncan Wynn, you are exactly right. Communicating early and often. I just see this, uh, I see this great contribution coming in over the chat, and I just have to give a complete shout out on that. Um, communicate early and often. Yes, 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 and yes. So red zone uh, risk number three, and it sort of actually relates to Duncan's comment here, failing to heed warnings of danger early enough. Again, you're in a highly dynamic, live, vibrant environment, and your change depends on a constellation of other people, some of whom you know, some of whom you know about, some of whom you do not even, whom you do not even know about. But indicators and warnings are basically flowing in if you are paying attention, if you are, as Duncan says, communicating early and often and, and using a two-way communication method so that you're really also actively listening uh, to the, the TV, so to speak. But too often, um, danger signals are sent. Um, they begin to ripple, um, and they're ignored, or they're not recognized, basically. Often, they're not recognized by the leader. Why? because the people that they're being filtered through have not been equipped either to recognize the signal as being, uh, you know, a signal that they need to be paying attention to, sort of the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, so you don't have enough people sounding that, that bell, that alarm, early enough. And next thing you know, your project is falling apart in the red zone. I mean, the bottom line is that you as the executive leader, you are not present for 99% of the interactions that will shape your success. Those things are happening around you without your involvement. So you absolutely must empower everyone on your team as a change leader and train them to be on the lookout, both for signs of success and for signs of possible danger. So this brings us that now to, our, to what I call the playbook, a formula for success 
with large scale change. I like to call it the score formula, staying with our football analogy. The F in the score formula stands for skill sets. Instill core change leadership skill sets in every member of your team that they may not have been prepared for by formal education. This is so essential. And you know, back in the day, these were called soft skills. I was a liberal arts major at JMU. In the meantime, I, I got a master's in information system. But I can absolutely tell you that across my career, especially in the first decade of my career, I had a lot of people sort of, you know, look down on, quote, the soft skills, listening, influence, conflict resolution, collaboration. These things are becoming the new hard skills. Soft skills are the new hard skills and skill, and every member of your team needs these if you're going to chart the smoothest path to profitable, sustained change in your organization or led by your organization. And I am thrilled because I am now, I have the privilege now of being in many of the classrooms across JMU and of seeing firsthand so much of what President Alger is doing with so much of his leadership focus on that campus at JMU and the Engage University vision that he, that he has set forth. And this is absolutely a school that is changing this. This school is instilling these soft skills in everyone from technology majors to business majors and it just makes me all the prouder to be a Duke. In fact, I just hired, we just hired, uh, inside, just hired a Duke. Um, and I will tell you, she actually beat out five other people that had made it into the top candidate realm um, and was our client's number one choice. Why? Because she had these soft skills. The bottom line is train your red shirts like your starters with these core leadership skill sets. And you just see here a list of some of what I personally think are some of the most important soft skills you can, you can equip your folks with. Executive mindset, leading change, influence, consensus building, strategic communication, conflict, and active listening. And we won't go into these in particular. I'll touch a little bit on the strategic communication piece later, but I just want to say about conflict. My, my position on conflict is don't run away from it, run towards it. Your biggest, highest point scores can come if you're willing to run towards the conflict and be the leader in that conflict. There's an agreement waiting to be struck inside of every conflict, at least from a business perspective. The C in the score formula stands for commitment. We talked a little bit about this earlier, but again, you know, compliance is a reasonable and sometimes necessary starting point when it comes to transformational change, but do not stop there. Make it your aim to get all of the key people all in if you want to generate recognizable and lasting results. And that commitment begins with the underpinning of consensus, but it doesn't stop there take those people all the way into a space of commitment. And what you see here is um, something that we use. I'm affiliated with something called the Justice Coaching Center, which is leading transformational change in our justice systems by modernizing a lot of these systems. And what you see here is consensus at the very top of this sort of eight-phase model here, consensus and then into commitment, into commitment before diving in to strategy and action and all of that being sort of in a context of a vision and a purpose and, and accountability. The O stands for ownership. So the O in our score formula stands for ownership. And this is really about um, the leader not just being the, you know, the, the head spokesperson and the main cheerleader sort of coming from the top or the champion is, you know, is common popular uh, language in leadership circles talking about the champion of something. Um, my strong belief is that you really need to move beyond a single champion of something and instill ownership among all of the projects for sponsors, financial sponsors, mission or operational business sponsors, technical sponsors, and relationship capital sponsors at every level of an org chart in all of those core stakeholders or organizations. You need to make it your aim that each one of those people and each one of those organizations begins to see themselves as an owner in that success vision. I like to talk about it's not one person leading 100, it's 100 people leading 100 times 100 people. That's how you ultimately exponentialize the change.
and really make it lasting. One of the big things a lot of my clients are concerned about right now is obviously the presidential transition, right? But the number one thing that I'm telling them is you, don't need, to, you, you need to worry a lot less about that if you can succeed with getting 100 people leading 100 times 100 people. If you can get that change instilled deep enough and wide enough, it is going to be much more difficult and much less interesting for a new political you know, um, party, basically, to try to dislodge. You're very vulnerable if whatever big thing you're leading is only led by you or your organization. The R stands for resistance. This is one of the number one things people fail to do. It's one of the most overlooked things, and that is identifying and neutralizing any resistance to the change and silent saboteurs who could work to silently sack your project or initiative, and they often love to pop up in the red zone because that's when you're complacent. That's when you've expended most of your resources. It, you must be constantly scanning the horizon on this. And this really isn't about um, playing a political chess game, um, while that is probably a good skill set to have. Um, what I'm talking about is transparently, openly, getting into convert, knowing who, this, who those people are and getting into conversation with those people early so that you can really understand where the resistance is, why, why the resistance is, and look for another approach if necessary uh, to, uh, as, as Emma just said, don't get sacked in that, you know, don't get sacked in the red zone, right? Um, you know, most people create a binary equation where they're looking at A or they're looking at B and, and this person is opposing A or B. And, they're, and now we've got the tug of war. Those are two out of an infinite number of possibilities. And the sooner you really get into an overt, transparent conversation with those people, the more likely you are to be able to create another possibility that what's the possibility that you haven't even considered yet? That may actually be where your answer lies. The one thing I like to talk about that I want to encourage all of you to do is to really know the players. Know who those players on the field are. Who are your allies? Who are your supporters? Who are the sideliners, the neutral parties that aren't going to take a side? Who are your opponents? And who, is your, who are your nemeses, if anyone? Who are the people that are going to go out of their way at great personal risk to sack you? You need to know who they are. And what's their, what I like to call PQ? What's their power quotient? Now, quickly, what I mean by power quotient, and this will be in the slides. You guys don't have to try to memorize all of this, but basically there's sort of two, first, first and foremost, what you see in that far left column is I really encourage my clients to make a list of every key stakeholder who they're aware of that could have an interest in this change in this set of decisions around this change. Who are those people by title and organization, if it's multiple organizations? What is their power in the decision? That's the PQ that you just saw in the previous slide, the power quotient. And I like to give them a rating of one, two, or three. Three means they're really powerful. They have a lot of power with respect to this particular decision. By the way, it does not mean their power generally, right? Obviously, a CEO, as you see in line number one here, uh, a CEO generally has a lot of power. But in this particular random example, um, I've given the CEO a score of one because the fact is they may not have a lot of interest in this particular decision or, or change. So they're not going to exert a lot of power around it. Whereas maybe in this, again, looking at this one example, the CFO uh, has a three. This particular decision is something that the CFO has power in and is willing to exert power in. So she has a score of a three. So you want to assess the power rating, and then you want to assess the opinion about the idea. So the CEO, with, with respect to this particular change, I'm giving a power rating of one. And how favorable or unfavorable are they to the idea? And I encourage my clients to give it a, a rating of any, basically a three-point scale, positive three to negative three. And don't give it zero, because ultimately you're going to multiply these columns. If they're very, very favorable, basically, and they're willing to go out of their way to support the idea, take personal risk to support it, you're giving them a positive three from an attitudinal opinion perspective. If they really like the idea, but they're not going to go out of the way to support it, you give them a two. If they're inclined to like the idea, give them a one. Inclined not to like the idea, it's a negative one. 
they really don't like the idea, but they're not going to go out of their way to eliminate it, it's a negative two. And if from their point of view, they have a lot to lose, they could, everything they care about could go away, so they will go out of their way to sack you in the red zone, they get a negative three on the opinion. Basically, this gives you, once you multiply those columns, you begin to get a sense of where the power dynamics are, who, where you need to focus your influence energy, basically, and influence campaign efforts um, to really basically move people into a space where your idea actually has a chance to, to take root and that ownership has a chance to actually happen, that transfer of ownership, basically. You want to see what that playing field looks like. What does, what does this particular chart tell you guys about the power dynamics here, if anyone uh, wants to throw it into the chat? I mean, what do they notice if they focus on that total score column on the far right against the various stakeholders? What are some of the things that you see here? I'm typing something in here. So you can see basically the COO in this particular example is potentially a big risk. It's a neg this person has a negative four. I might need to spend some, you know, some, um, I want to spend some time maybe meeting with this person. On the other hand, the CIO in this particular example um, has a score of nine. That's the maximum score, three times three. That person is going to be a huge advocate for us. So maybe I'm in conversation with that person about, you know, their center, their circles of influence, who and how can, you know, who can they influence on our, on our influence map here? Um, and, and, you know, what kind of a relationship maybe does that person have, for example? Beautiful, Debbie Long. Thank you. Yes, the CIO is an important ally. I'm giving Debbie Long uh, a round of applause here. And does that person have a good relationship with the COO? Maybe they do. Maybe that's a conversation that can shed some light. Maybe that person, that CIO is the person who can um, help shift the COO. One last thing I'll mention on this particular um, slide is that you can typically move people um, up two points. People will typically move up or down two points. Obviously, you want them moving up. You can't really move them more than that. Um, but you know what? Fear not. You don't need a nemesis, a negative three. You don't need that person to become your biggest ally. You just need to move them out of a zone where they're willing to expend energy to try to sack your initiative, right? So that, that's what the focus needs to be. Just get them out of that zone where they could be a danger to you. What you see here is that stakeholder analysis that we just did a moment ago, right? It's now in a visual form. And these are just example tools that you guys can use. Um, you know, you don't have to use them with everything. I, I do encourage my clients, um, higher the stakes, the more I encourage them to sit down and put this kind of thought into really looking at the playing field. Most people put less time into thinking about um, the influence map of their transformational change initiative than our JMU football team does planning for one football game. They are absolutely studying the players on the opponent's team. They are absolutely studying the patterns and how those players play and what we should anticipate when they get on the field. And when we do this play, we should anticipate them to do this other play. They're totally studying that before they get on the field. How many of us really do that systematically in our business or government change basis? Very, very few, I can tell you from my own experience over 20 years. So what you see here, though, is a visual look at this, right? So the bigger the box, the bigger the PQ, the bigger the power quotient of that person relative to the decision, relative to the change that we're talking about. The small box means it's a smaller, less important player with respect to this decision. The red and the green, again, are they favorable or unfavorable? And this can just help you sort of get an organ, you know, sort of a, a visual on it. You could do this by organizations even. Um, this is obviously looking inside of one organization. It looks like an org chart. But you could do this if you have multi-organizational change. You could have each of these boxes. Uh, represent an organization and really get a sense of that influence map so that you're not inefficient, you're not inactive or inert or inefficient in the way you expend your influence resources. That's the whole point of what we just covered with that whole R and overcoming the resistance. And number, the, the final uh, element of the, of the score formula is the E, engage. 
Engage every member of your team, your organization, and your stakeholders throughout the project lifecycle through strategic communication. That's one key tool that you can use. I like to call it, uh, I like to talk about something called the three A's. This is definitely um, considered standard practice in the field of public relations. Um, awareness, attitude, and action. It's a sequential thing. You have to first build enough awareness with enough of the right people to then begin to shape and mold attitude by inspiring and motivating action. So first you have to have awareness to then shape attitudes. And finally, you can enable the action. And you must be very clear about the desired action that you want people to take. When we talk about engagement, that's a term that's used a lot, very generally. Um, a couple of key principles to be successful with your engagement. You need to have measurable, observable objectives for each specific audience sector. Most people have objectives for their initiative. They don't define objectives within each specific audience segment. That is critical because what you might need legislative people to do is totally different than what you might need your internal people to do, which is totally different than what you want uh, these other stakeholders and partners and what kinds of actions you want those stakeholders and partners to be taking uh, versus objectives you may have for parties that are resistant to the change. So you really need to segment that out, define measurable objectives for each of those audiences, and then develop compelling audiences, com I'm sorry, compelling messages, messages that penetrate the white noise, get their attention, overcome or neutralize resistance, and really anchor them in how taking your desired action is strongly in their interest. And that takes a lot of thoughtfulness and a lot of care, uh, which is to me part of what makes this kind of work very, very fun. There's actually a, a lot of caring is involved in the most successful change out there. And then finally, the continuous two-way communication. And I think Duncan hit on this, um, and, and Debbie has alluded to this as well in some of her comments, but um, it's not just about you talking with them. It's really about you doing at least as much listening um, as talking and course calibrating, calibrating the message, calibrating your, your strategies uh, so that you're really bringing those people closer and closer and closer into uh, that ownership position around the change initiative. And if you follow the score formula, you will score with your high stakes projects, uh, your high stakes change projects. And truly, uh, I've seen it firsthand. It's immensely thrilling. Um, you'll truly change the world. Um, lives are better, uh, unbelievably better because of it. And from a business standpoint, um, you know, it's, it's, you're going to be more profitable. You're going to grow your, your company. And, and that's a great thing because you get to do more fun things like this with that. So with that, you know, that, that's really as far as the presentation goes. I'm open to any questions if, there, uh, if we've received any questions. I definitely thank all of you for your great comments along the way. Um, and uh, just a quick note on who we are. Again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm CEO of a company called AHA Insight uh, that I actually founded after 20 years of, of working with a very large corporation, which was a phenomenal learning ground for me. And we are a, a group of executive coaches, performance consultants, communication specialists, and psychologists who use evidence-based approaches to help develop leaders uh, inside government and corporate uh, organizations to, and help those organizations get even better results with their complex high-stakes change initiatives. And uh, I am a proud JMU Duke, and it's just a thrill to be with all of you all today. And so go Dukes! And I guess at this point, Emma, I'll take any questions if there are any. Sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I don't know about anybody else, but this has really gotten me excited for the game tomorrow. Um, you definitely incorporated football and specifically our beloved Dukes throughout your presentation. Um, so we are so excited that it's homecoming. Um, and we learned so much. Um, we're getting feedback right now saying super um, awesome job on the presentation. Um, a few questions. Uh, I know you talked about AHA Insight, um, but I wanted to know if you wouldn't mind sharing just a little bit about your new book um, and uh, what that's going to be about and when we all can expect it to be available. Absolutely, Emma. Yes, thank you. Yes, my new book is called The Day One Executive. It is due to be published this spring, hopefully prior to graduation. 
Uh, and this really is something that is very near and dear to my heart, and that is really helping young people stand out as the executive they already are, I like to say, but to stand out among executives as the executive they already are, beginning on day one of their careers, rather than that being something sort of in a distal future or something that they might one day aspire to, uh, that they really understand that being an executive is a choice, that they can make that choice starting right now, um, and it's really a way of seeing the world, and there are certain very specific attitudinal and behavioral indicators that will cause you to stand out and be recognized, actually, by other executives as someone who is an executive. And that's going to not only, um, th that, that not only just opens up phenomenal possibilities in a person's career, um, those possibilities coming earlier to them, um, I, I'm also absolutely passionate about the fact that that can change financial futures for people. The sooner you're willing and able to, uh, and equipped to show up like that, um, the more control you have in general in your life. And, and, I, and I want people to have as much choice as they possibly can have in their life. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that. We're so excited. Um, as you can see, Duncan uh, sent a note here. Um, uh, he is a former JMU player. Um, and an IT project manager with 20 years of experience in the field. Awesome. And he had a, yeah, yeah, well, thank you, Duncan. Um, we hope yeah. you'll be at the game, too, to cheer on the, the new players here. Um, but Duncan did have a question. Um, he asked, uh, controlling scope is very important in the red zone. So what yes. are your recommendations on controlling scope? So my, that is a fantastic question, Duncan. My number one recommendation is that, that, um, that, that you as a leader are acutely aware of how you define the scope and from the various dimensions of how you define scope um, and that you, that you are in clear and explicit agreement with the, you know, the project sponsor and, and anyone else who can influence that uh, early on, and then that you are continually re-enrolling, you're continually reminding them every single time you meet with them, reminding them. So again, this is where we are, are on scope. Um, you're just, you know, you're literally saying it every single time you meet, so that the minute something begins to look like it could even cast a shadow outside of the scope, you're able to say right away, you know, that potentially could fall outside of our scope. And now you're not in this tug of war of, oh, well, I don't think so, well, I do think so, well, I don't think so, because they've forgotten about where the scope is. You've been reminding them along the way where the fence post is. So that when you say that, they're like, oh, you know, it's not a problem. They're like, yeah, you're right, no problem. You know, we can renegotiate this. I don't know if that answers your question, but one of the biggest things I've seen is that the problem comes up when either use the project team leader, uh, not, not you per se, Duncan, but in general, project team leaders, they lose sight themselves of where the scope boundaries are until something's out of scope and they've already expended the money and now they have a problem, or they're failing to remind the client where the scope boundaries are and the client has forgotten, and now the client's asking for more and now you're in this tug of war because they're trying to tell you they think it's in scope and you know it's not. Yeah, it does happen on both sides, Duncan. Yeah, did that answer your question, Duncan? It's the continuous conversation, keeping agreement, as you said, Duncan. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Awesome. Thanks, Duncan. Um, yeah, so uh, also kind of going with, you know, when you were talking about the football theme, being in that red zone, you know, the players have given it their all to get to that point or defend that point. Um, and I'm sure they're tired. <laughs> um, so how do you keep that, as like that leader of that group, how do you maintain that respect and loyalty of your staff or your team during these growing pain um, or really pivotal moments in that change? So when, if the question pertains to your team, I mean, you know, this is going to sound trite, but I have to say the, the number one thing that, um, that I really see is the antidote, antidote to that fatigue um, and to really helping the team go all the way is actually fun, is injecting fun into the workplace, into the project team. 
um, and, and being intentional about it even, not only, you know, allowing that in, in the culture, especially if you have a culture of high performers, you can definitely allow that fun in. It's not going to it's not going to um, reduce performance. It's going to actually, I find it to be a performance accelerator, um, but also intentionally, you know, planning that in. I, I, when I was actually working in the, the White House Homeland Security um, top official project that I mentioned earlier, I distinctly remember, and I was actually the team leader, and we're grinding away working like 16-hour days because we've got to get this report that's going to be signed out for the president. And one of my team members made reservations for us to go to a baseball game. And I remember at the time thinking, what? We can't do this. We can't afford to go to Baltimore and watch this baseball game. we got this report due in 48 hours. Um, and she happened to be an, organi uh, an organizational psycho cognitive psychologist. And she basically showed me the research um, around how stepping outside of, the, outside of the intensity of the work and really having that intentional fun um, can really catalyze performance. So I went along with it, um, and ever since then, I, I was a complete believer because we all came back from that so refreshed, so energized. We had laughed, we had had fun, and we were literally all of us able to just make that final full court press all the way to the end zone and um, and be successful doing it. So fun. That's my short answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that. I think we can all uh, agree with that. And then let's just end. On a fun note here, what's your what's your favorite JMU memory as being a student, maybe during homecoming, um, just to end in the spirit of things this week? Wow, favorite JMU memory. I know, Gosh. it's hard, hard to narrow it down, I'm sure. You know what? I just have to say probably, I mean, there's I've, a thousand favorite things about JMU, but um, you know what comes to mind right away when I think about homecoming? Obviously, we've been talking about football, but I am the biggest marching Royal Dukes fan you will find. <laughs> I love our band. I cannot watch those people without, like, crying because I love them so much. They just make every molecule of my being come to life. I think they're phenomenal, and they just so embody and just – blast the JMU spirit. I love the Marching Royal Dukes, and I have since I was there, um, and I still do. They're just amazing. So, I am with you on that. They definitely <laughs> bring, in, bring in the fun that you're talking about. They um, do. <laughs> um, well, thank you again so much, April. We really appreciate um, your presentation today. Um, and on behalf of the JMU Alumni Association, I want to thank everyone for their time. Um, and definitely please take a moment to complete the survey that you'll receive when you exit this webinar. Uh, your feedback helps us to continue to provide tailored programming like this for you, our alumni. And we hope that you will join us for our next webinar on Thursday, November 17th at noon. And that's featuring alumna Laura Taylor as she presents Mentoring Made Easy as Pie, Setting One More Seat at the Table This Thanksgiving. If you or someone you know is interested in being one of our presenters, have them contact me, Emma Maynard, at M-A-Y-N-A-R-E-F at J-M-U dot E-D-U. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great afternoon, and happy homecoming.